On the road, let's travel with Gary Allen Gigi's Boo. Now we're recording on reallibertymedia.com and RLM Radio. And Gigi's Boo is here. How you doing? I'm doing good. Good. Glad to hear it. I always have these last second, truly last second hiccups, and all of a sudden our audio wasn't working. So I had to restart some stuff, and you know, and as a result, the I did, at least we did remember to start Audacity within the first 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's always an advantage. So everyone's doing well. So where is Atticus? What's Atticus doing? Well, he's in yonder, and he's just fine and dandy. Mm. Mm. Fine and dandy, as long as he doesn't start barking at the dog in the curio cabinet. Oh, God. He let's, and that dog. Let's don't get started. Yeah, let's don't get him started. So what's everybody doing out there in the chat room? If you're not in the chat room, over on reallibertymedia.com, R-E-A-L, you know, real, not as in a Virginia real, but in real, libertymedia.com, you're missing out on the whole show, the whole show. I got, got a few people in here, not as good as last week, interestingly, in Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> <laughs> with a tremendous number of uh, archive listens so far on that show, and I, I don't know how to account to that for that. But anyway, we got some folks over here in the chat room. If you're not with them, then you're just missing out. We got Grimnir, and who owns this place. He owns this popsicle stand, takes care of it, and, and it's that time of year again, by the way, that bills are due. And Grimner could always use a little bit of help if you enjoy the content here on reallibertymedia.com and all the blogcasters and the years and years and years of archived shows and links to the sources, which we always put in. Then you probably want to help. Throw a little money, Bitcoin, whatever, PayPal. Use the Amazon link to order something if you're an Amazon person. And just you can also just drop a note and say thanks, Grimner, for everything you do. And then there's Moose Girl and Kate and Asmo and Beth and Chelsea Denny and Chloe. Graham Z, I be Don C, Java Doctor, JJ. Yeah, he's in the chat room actually. Hello, JJ. Wanna Taco, Meister Brown, Rain, Rob Works, Trust No One, Beetle showing up behind Woodshed, that's how. Colfax, Dakota, Dima, Frumpy, Gigi's Boo, Kozu, Mbot, who is a, I forget what the MM is, I knew it one time, but it's a bot, Paul, Paul Bunyan, P. Bunyan, Poxified, Pawn Sauce, Slim Jim Flim, Teddy, and the Phantom. And Grimner says they're there. Yeah, where's everybody else? Where's all the, where's all the peoples? All the peoples likes to listen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know where he is, Gigi's boo. They're hanging around. Well, uh, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> People are funny. People are strange. They can't help it. It's like that, because he can't help it. Can't help it. All you can do is just let them go on. We've got some interesting stuff to talk about, if I can find it. <laughs> there we go. And all this mess on this storyboard. That's some interesting, interesting interaction. Seems like social media, and we, a lot of people talk about social media and the control elements and the internet being choked down and all that good stuff. Seems like some of the better known places like Facebook and Twitter, they have their share of censorship apparently going on, or at least crafting the message, whatever, however you want to refer to it. Project Veritas, he's been all over that. In fact, it seems that Twitter can't get enough shadow banning. They continue to do it, according to what I'm looking at, even after being outed. And, you know, of course, some sources nowhere near as bad as Facebook is. And I just recently had an experience with that. Kind of a fun thing. And I promised I was going to put this out because, you know, you just got to give credit where credit's due, right, Gigi's boo? Mm-hmm. But there was an article that was linked up on Facebook through one of the local 
television stations. Presences, I suppose. WSLSTV.com in Roanoke, Virginia. Got to give credit where credit's due. They posted a link from their website, WSLS.com, that says the Albemarle County, Virginia School Board decided that it was not in the best interest of students to celebrate Lee Jackson Day anymore. And this comes right on the, you know, the heels of the events in Charlottesville with statues, you know, we have to tear statues down and blah, 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 and all this, all this nutty stuff that's going on. And I put a comment in the, underneath the post, basically a quote that described the creation of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory and how this these sorts of erasures of culture and history would be consistent to what would come out of the Frankfurt School. Well, guess what? Facebook's AI immediately marked that as a spam entry. Yeah, it just didn't miss a beat. Called it spam. So I said, oh, okay. You want to play that way? Let's go to WSLS's website wsls.com and underneath in the comments section uh, the article that uh, says beginning next school year uh, Albemarle County Public School Board announced no more Lee Jackson Day blah 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 saying that we do not believe it's in the best interests of our entire school community to list Lee Jackson Day as a time for celebration and that was a statement from Deputy Superintendent Matthew Haas, H-A-S-S. So, underneath the comment, or in the comment section underneath the article, I merely stated that my response was marked as spam on Facebook, perhaps because I referenced the Frankfurt School. Well, shortly, that comment was disabled. Yeah. Yeah. For which I commented again, being the asshole that I am, laugh out loud, content disabled, what cowards you are. And of course, no response to that. You can even call these people cowards, and then they just... It's a little bit like all this hoorah about memos and special prosecutors. I have not yet once heard the word special grand jury. Isn't that where one would logically apply one's efforts if you were really looking at a remedy for wrongdoing? Wouldn't that fall within the purview of a special grand jury? But no, no one even wants to respond to that as if it doesn't exist. So what part of this makes me think political theater? Most of it. Anyway, getting back to the Frankfurt School, after that encounter, it's not the first one that's happened made me wonder i wanted to learn or at least share a little bit what i've learned about what exactly is the frankfurt school of critical theory and how this ties into prepping will become obvious hopefully shortly (laughs) before we're finished it's a school of social theory and philosophy that was originally uh, part of the social research at goethe university in frankfurt ergo the name frankfurt school and it was founded between World War I and World War II. It consisted of neo-Marxists who were dissidents that were uncomfortable with the existing capitalist, fascist, or communist systems. Many of these theorists believed that traditional theory could not adequately explain the turbulent and unexpected development of capitalist societies in the 20th century, Critical of both capitalism and Soviet socialism, their writings pointed to the possibility of an alternative path to social development. So they're talking about a hybrid form of democracy, essentially as a collective type of effort, as to make a long story short. Turns out that the Nazis got a little bit mad at them in 1933 and kicked them out of Germany. People say the Frankfurt School doesn't exist anymore. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that, yes, it does. Because when they were kicked out of Germany, they took up residence at Columbia University in New York City. Fascinating here. I have a few articles that I'll link 
as we go along that describe for those of you who have an interest in really digging into this and starting to see the picture that comes from it and at least a potential explanation for some of the things that we are experiencing today, particularly in social media, internet, and any really any sorts of virtual interactive contact, if you will. You might see some of this in some of the political events, obviously. You might see some of this reflected from Frankfurt School critical theory. And I have a couple of really in-depth articles I definitely will not try to get into because uh, they're, they're, they're somewhat like uh, an academic presentation that turns everybody's eyes back in their head. But, you know, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy has an article about it. All the way back to 2005, but what, I guess, the real takeaway out of all this, so you look at Columbia University, it's a private university in New York City. Well, who were some of the notable alumni from Columbia University who, in all probability, would have been exposed to this sort of thinking? How about Barack Obama? Hmm, he's one of their distinguished alumni. How about Warren Buffett? He's another one. How about, let's see, uh, got to keep things in time frame here. Max Kellerman. Anybody heard of Max Kellerman? Well, Milton Friedman, the economist. Hmm. Could he have been potentially influenced by Frankfurt School thinking? How about Leonard Cohen? There's a long list. Many of them actually are your Hollywood types. Stanley Kubrick. Interesting. Martha Stewart. <laughs> All these people from Columbia University, the, you know, not saying that they were influenced by the Frankfurt School of thinking, but interestingly, that found a home there. So it's logical to assume that at least some of that philosophy is, leaks out into the academic processes on the university. Interesting stuff. And this is how we get start now getting into something called the psychology, a new kind of SIGDEV. Now, what in the heck is SIGDEV? SIGDEV is an acronym for Signals Development, and that comes from NSA, you see. So how does this work out? Well, it works out that there was a leaked, classified presentation that came from the UK Intel folks, and this was on the intercept.com that tells you everything that you probably don't want to know about the processes that are used to affect YouTube and Facebook and all these sorts of things. And say 44 slide presentations, all classified, at a high level actually, it talks all about it, like online human intelligence, like how to have strategic influence, how to disrupt. And then they introduced the term CNA, which I really wasn't sure what CNA was all about. CNA turns out to be operations that are designed to damage, destroy, or disrupt computers or operations controlled by computers such as the Stuxnet attack that targeted centrifuges used by Iran to enrich uranium hexafluoride gas. Another CNA operation attributed to nation-states is the air-to-ground hack conducted by Israel in 2007 against Syria's air defense systems. That hack launched from Israeli planes was designed to prevent Syria's automated air defense from seeing bomber jets flying in to attack the Al-Kibar complex. That, of course, was believed to be an illicit nuclear reactor. <laughs> right. Okay. This is all like a very broad brush overview of what you're up against and what is becoming more and more powerful to the use of artificial intelligence and things like that. It's like the Facebook response to my post was instantaneous spam. So that's an AI in operation. It saw certain keywords or something like that, and bang, marked it as spam. It's not the first time that's happened of late. So one of the takeaways here, and I think a big takeaway, is to stop being so reliant on virtual interaction. Because 
virtual interaction has now been very effectively controlled. So what's the alternative? Well, it's the old-fashioned way, right, Gigi's boo, of actually talking with Mm -hmm. people locally, establishing relationships locally. I've been going on for a long time. You have any thoughts at all, or you want me to? No, I'm I'm listening to you tonight. Okay, that's fine. Then we'll see if we can make a whole hour of this. (laughs) Okay. I don't want I don't want to make anybody's eyes cross, but this is really to me. This is really getting into the heart of the biscuit. The crux of the biscuit, because this is how people are being controlled. And more and more, you see the on the whole business about the 5G rollout. We have to make it easier and easier for people to have their interactions controlled on a global basis. And at the same time, make money in the process, which is, interestingly, when you go back to the critical theory of philosophy... Kind of all ties together, you know, melding a, a capitalistic approach with a collectivist approach. Uh, we control things, and we are profitable that way. One, I think, one of the big criticisms against the communist model by the Franklin School was the fact that it was inefficient. It was economically inefficient. Well, hey, we can fix that. We can make it efficient and still totalitarian, all at the same time. And I can think that people like, well, you know, maybe, perhaps, people like Warren Buffett or people like the Rockefellers would certainly find this advantageous. Because as long as you can enrich yourself, at the same time, control what people think, do, and say, and where they spend their monies, and control competition through a a centrist-style totalitarian state, if you will. Hey, you control all these things very effectively, you see. Is that not consistent, at least, with what we see or experiences? Sometimes that's how we have to evaluate things. Are, Are they consistent with the evidence of our own senses? I think they are. And just to get a little more in depth with mind control tactics. This is from Christoph.com, Christoph Health. Mind control tactics used within Facebook. Now, they use Facebook, but I think we can probably extend this to most of, most of the social medias and Twitter and so forth. Some things like the casino effect, and which basically, pretty much like it sounds, that's uh, the King Biscuit flower. Yeah, thanks, Grimmer. <laughs> Okay, the casino effect. Basically, well, like it sounds, all the all those alluring rings and nings and bing, 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 and all that stuff at the casino is designed to elicit a particular response from you. And that response is to put more money into the one-armed bandits, or armless bandits as they are now. Basically, the sounds of attention can help decorate someone's empty life and set up a Facebook addiction. Now, this goes right back to the the remedy, one of the remedies, of connecting with real people again, connecting locally. Nothing wrong with meetups. How many things, how many subjects might one be able to come up with and post for a meetup that other folks might be interested in talking about or hearing about? There's all kinds, but, you know, that's a very underused thing. And that isn't, that's an example of where technology can be your friend. It says, when people react to our posts with likes and comments, it triggers a satisfaction substance called dopamine, proven to initiate addictive behavior. This agenda revolves around breaking down traditional family and community bonds, hello, by making people bond with computers and electronics, as opposed to family and other humans. One of the founders of Facebook explained the same in his commentary, which I won't read. Then we get into facial recognition. Wow, how neat is that? It can track you across the world. You think they're not good at this? They're very good at this. You don't need much of your face anymore to be able to get a positive ID on you. When they want to track you everywhere in case you leave the control grid. Facial recognition is one part of human farming operations. 
human farming operations. Emotional venting. Ah, here's a good one. That old pressure release valve I think Hal talks about in his show uh, 3 to 5 on Sundays behind the woodshed. They have that safety valve occasionally to roll out. And so I wonder if we're not experiencing some of that right now with this uh, political theater minus a special grand jury. The emotional venting of the slave class is a simple technology which is used in many other areas, not just Facebook. It's about making the slave class believe they have a say and some form of control by allowing them to vent off emotion or rebellion potential and to divert that angry energy away from the abusive slave masters. They don't mince words here. And, of course, they use the like function to drive addiction that goes back to the dopamine thing. And the control venting, that's another thing. Then that, that's where it's interesting. Like, my little, my little commentary got, got marked as spam, even though it was a vent. It probably was a little too close to the target because the flak came up. You can usually identify if you're over the target or not pretty easily. And I think most of us already know that. Dissident tracking. That's something to keep in mind. Are you a dissident? We probably are considered such, and maybe most of the folks in this chat room, except for the observers who listen, who are on another mission, but they're everywhere. Anytime, you know, you hear that we have this whole business now about the Libertarian Party and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Anytime you get an organized group together, they're going to infiltrate and they'll ultimately take control. So don't even go there. I mean, we've got to get back to that whole uh, asymmetrical concept of accidentally everyone showing up in the same place. Just by accident. Dissonant tracking. Facebook algorithms track who's posting pictures of their cats and their glass of wine on a Friday night. Facebook also tracks who actually knows what's going on. Ooh, guess what? Ding, ding, ding. Both types of people are targets using different methods. Behavior analysis. Yeah, there we go. This, this gets into that uh, future crime business. Behavior of the collective Facebook community is analyzed daily regarding if the public is still under hypnosis or not. So they're making sure that everybody's staying inside the bucket. And it goes on and on. It talks about emojis, emojis, delayed comment, dinging operation. I'm not sure what that's all about. Anyway, we'll we'll drop this list link in for everybody to check out. It's pretty interesting. As you can tell, emotionally charged in its words. But, you know, it's, it is what it is. Gigi's boo. Woo. It's not yes. even, we're not even halfway through yet. <laughs> So let's change gears a little bit. Anything at all you want to? No, go nope. ahead. Okay. Just want, want to keep on checking with you. Maybe Atticus has something to say. I don't know. But... I doubt that. No, you never know. Atticus, he, he'll pipe up from time to time. All right, let's change gears. Let's talk about what the heck is going on in the world. And what what are what are the threats that you know? One of the things that I think you'll notice, you know, if something is really really super duper classified secret, blah blah blah, in all probability you're never going to hear of it. And the old thing about you can't know what you don't know, and there's a lot of that. There's a lot of stuff still out there that we don't know about, and through the wonderful magic of compartmentalization. Those things exist, and they're out there. And you don't hear about them. And what's even better than that is when you do hear a little bit of something about something going on, but the media is completely quiet, completely blacks it out. They don't want to talk about it. Ah, there we go. That's the inverse of being over the target with the flak, the fact that they don't talk about it when it's obviously an issue. That's pretty telling in itself. And the whole business, a couple of things, actually, I want to go into with that. One of them is, is what's happening in the climate? What's going on in the climate world? I uh, don't know, a lot of you probably are familiar with the, with the YouTube page, Suspicious Observers. And they 
pretty much keep an eye on not just the weather, but all the space events and these sorts of things. And they have some interesting interesting theories that they that they talk about. One of the things, though, which is not a theory and it's been been discussed pretty much at length by many people, is the weakening of the Earth's magnetic field. And what type of effects will that have on the Earth? And now we're getting a little bit of theory there. To some extent, but I think there again, your senses might help you appreciate some of what you're about to hear. This is going to be about a 10-minute talk, so don't let your eyes cross too much. It's Ben Davidson. This is we'll talk a little bit about Earth's magnetic field and how the weakening will have, that what he believes will have, significant events occur on Earth. And this goes right back to your prepping. He actually talks about prepping. So let's go ahead and check that out. In this episode of our ongoing look at Earth's magnetic reversal, we'll build on our previous summaries. We've seen how the magnetic poles are speeding up on collision course offshore Indonesia. Earth's magnetic fields went from weakening 5% per century to 5% per decade. Numerous recent studies confirm these events can happen within a human lifetime, and the mission manager Gary. from ESA Swarm says the Earth's magnetic poles are getting ready to flip. Yeah, I've got a video. We've looked at solar activity and oh, cosmic I'm sorry. rays, I'm sorry. discussing how the increased bombardment of Earth can trigger increased seismic and volcanic activity. We've seen how the sun's activity modulates El Nino and La Nina, the Pacific and North Atlantic oscillations, the intertropical convergence zones and monsoonal patterns all set to deliver negative phases and dramatic shifts from the last few centuries as the sun hits grand minimum over the coming few years to decades and Earth's magnetic field continues to weaken. But thus far, our weather look in the magnetic reversal has been a long-term one, a climate-forcing expectation based on the currently published literature and taking it a bit further with the grand solar minimum coming and Earth's magnetic reversal underway. However, the lithospheric effects we've seen are much shorter term. But to have their effects on the ground, the space energy must first navigate the atmosphere and the global electric circuit. The recognition of cosmic rays and solar activity as having a modulating effect on lightning and other short-term weather phenomena goes back well before those seismic, volcanic, and long-term weather connections to space. Over the last few decades, much driven by Dr. Brian Tinsley out of Texas, an incredible amount of information on space energy and lightning, cloud formation, atmospheric ionization, hail, nucleation, and more has been steadily coming out. Cosmic ray-induced particle showers are so well understood to have effects on short-term cloud properties that even the IPCC recognized the need to investigate these cosmic connections to terrestrial weather. Today, the effects on ice nucleation, cloud condensation, and lightning showers are well recognized, even if we're still trying to figure out the minutia of how it all works. So now, just like before, as Earth's magnetic field weakens and the sun enters grand minimum this century, both of Earth's shields against cosmic rays are dwindling, and we should ask what effects there will be, and should we be looking beyond the recent Princeton bombshell about the cooling effects of clouds? The best summarization of the air-shower cosmic ray effects is electric. The cosmic ray particle cascade starts off as one super energetic proton breaking down into muons, electrons, neutrons, and photons as it collides and scatters its energy through the atmosphere. More lightning storms, more lightning strikes, stronger lightning strikes, more cloud cover, and higher variability of that cloud cover, easier freezing of supercooled water into more, larger hail. And there is even considerable evidence growing in regard to wind speed correlation with solar wind parameters. All the things that make these correlations true have to first overcome the magnetic shield of our planet, and in terms of cosmic rays, the sun's magnetic shield as well. That means that the weather can only intensify as the electric cascade from space intensifies. Now, Let's take some time to go over some basic prepping notes. No way to do this comprehensively in this video or in one video alone, but we can get you started. I want to hit two points right now. How should you prepare? And are there some areas in the world that are going to be in worse trouble than others? Let's start with the basic prepping. So as to not overload all at once, let's get our heads around some of the basic things you need in any emergency, long or short. It's good to have food, water, and supplies, including for yourself, your family, and your pets. 
The other basic part of this is keeping your head out of the sand. I assure you that you won't be hearing major updates from CNN, reality TV, celebrity Twitter accounts, etc., so making sure you are paying attention to the right places is probably one of the best ways you can prepare. However, the Earth's magnetic reversal, combining with solar grand minimum, presents some challenges to the basic prepper. These events may not be short-term. In fact, they are unlikely to be, especially when we are talking about the potential grid effects. At the National Space Weather Forum in Washington, D.C. last year, I sat listening to how unprepared we were, how our electrified way of survival can be taken away in a matter of hours. And since only a handful of groups have all the contracts for emergency aid pretty much everywhere, it is commonly believed that such a business model is based on things not getting too bad in too many places all at once, certainly not everywhere at the same time. So, what else should you consider? The first thing that comes to mind for this non-comprehensive list, please do recognize there is so much more, is the long-term need for that food and water not to mention those medicines and pet supplies that might apply to your personal situation. Our government says we could be down months to years, so seeds and tools and books on how to live are useful in that type of life, maps on local areas, goods to barter, especially vice goods, clothes for extreme weather, etc., but also the mental side of things, local ways to survive the plants, trees, the insects, mushrooms, the terrain, the waterways. What about your neighbors? Do you have a bug out plan? What about a bug in plan? If you can stay in your castle, it is always best. You're starting to get the picture of how comprehensive a mental exercise this can be in addition to the physical preparation. But let's now go to an overview of areas of the world that are likely to be under duress. I absolutely did move my family across the country. Now this is not a move everyone can or should make. My job is here online and can be done anywhere, my wife is our CEO and is capable of anything, and my kids are not yet in school, not much tying me back. I am not willing to bet against all the available data I can find, or the patterns of our planet that have persisted since long before humans started their first fire. If I could even find one clue that we were not on the verge of a reversal, I'd say so, but I can't, and I chose a place I find suitable against many future hardships. Let's take these one at a time. First thing that comes to mind is the coastline. Not only are there a lot of people, and people means chaos in an emergency, but the earthquakes and tsunamis, including those from subsurface ocean volcanoes triggering landslides, means that the coastal regions present a major concern, even if you're not at a major fault line. Do you know how to spot the pre-tsunami warning signals? Could be the difference between survival and something else. Even on the U.S. East Coast, where they don't have major earthquake risk, they have the Canary Islands across the Atlantic and the Puerto Rico Trench waiting for a landslide to send a massive wave at the coast. We mentioned the high population areas already, and this one is pretty simple. More chances for chaos, less resources in a disaster, crowded exodus from weather or tsunamis. One of the most basic location safety points is you wouldn't want to be in Times Square when everything bad begins to go down. Let's step down to the severe weather events. It's not like you'll see tornadoes in Death Valley or Mount Everest or even here in the high desert, but areas that see them could see more. The breadbasket is going to see hailstorms like they've never seen before. The wind, precipitation, ice, flash flooding, all intensifying. So picking your battleground is important for us here in New Mexico. There are no quakes or tsunamis, not really any tornadoes, and Less of the other severe risks as well, provided you are not living in an arroyo. We also have a low geomagnetic vulnerability profile. Mid-latitude is by far the safest in terms of space weather. Polar regions take the strongest induction, and that does indeed bleed down into the United States. The practical reality for us humans is that the risk is a combination of population density, or rather electric grid density, grid usage, along with your geomagnetic latitude, which is why you see increased potential even during calm days down the coastlines. However, one can't simply head south from Canada per se without looking back. Get too far south and you come under duress of the equatorial electrojet and the magnetospheric compression of solar eruptions reinforcing the downward precipitation of Earth's equatorial ion fountain and adding Van Allen particles to the precipitation as well. We do indeed see equatorial excitation and risk potential growing along the equator, 
with the polar regions. And let's not forget the South Atlantic anomaly is there, the most prolific upsetter of satellite GPS in the space age. Now thinking back to high latitude risk one more time, the last note is one about cold. Since cold records doubled heat records last month in the U.S., since snow records continue falling, since Princeton described a cooler future than models predict from above, and Yale did so from below, and with our current interglacial overdue for a major drop in temperatures on this planet, one must caution against the warming-only propaganda in the news. Climate change absolutely goes both ways, and with the sun going to sleep as our shields falter, it's a recipe for deadly cold events if you are too far north or south. You've seen the primary website, magneticreversal.org, and it is frustrating that the next official update is still two years away. By the way, that is because the poles make large circles in their movement over short times and up to a full year, and only by tracing those circles over time can you ascertain the general movement of the poles. The last update came without a new percentage down of our field, but we're likely somewhere around 20% or maybe a bit more. And now, if you want to do some tracking over shorter time scales, we watch the effect on tropical storms, cyclones, and typhoons, one of the connections that led Ferris Wald to win the National Middle School Science Championship this year. If you want to see how well correlated these events actually are, we have tracked space energy effects on that most severe weather since that 2015 update over at earthchanges.org, and we'll keep tracking. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone. That was Ben Davidson. It was the audio version of a video that he put out. And yes, it was uh, had a lot of scientific terminology in there, and he moves along pretty rapidly. But isn't some of what he described consistent with our observations, that we're starting to see the phenomenon increasing? And uh, there was just recently a, a weather event that uh, where a lot of trees were just knocked down. And I don't remember exactly where it was, but it's just within the last week or so. These sorts of things are happening, and, there, and this could, in fact, be one of these significant tr contributors to all this. Now, obviously, I mean, the Earth is like three and a half billion years old, I guess. And so, <laughs> three and a half billion years is a long time. And I spend a little bit of my time tracking catastrophism, and the evidence that I see, at least in reviewing the literature, is that we're pretty knowledgeable about what happened up to about 7,000 years ago. Beyond that, we don't really know a whole lot. So such a very, very small, infinitesimally small snapshot of time when you consider the overall age of the Earth. It kind of suggests that maybe there's a whole lot more prior to 7,000 years ago than we're typically led to believe, and that some significant events occurred during those periods, of, during that period of time, pretty much uh, reset the board. And that's kind of the feel that I get from looking at the literature. But anyway, all that aside, Ben talks a little bit about some of the preparations, and there we go back into that local business again and being prepared locally, and something that Gigi's boot talks about, it's what we all talk about at times, is learning how to cook, how to plant, how to hunt, how to preserve your meat, how to preserve all your other foods. And these are things that have been made to sound so weird, I guess, so conspiratorial, that a lot of people turn away from, even from the term prepper, so it's not a good idea. There, there are serious indications that this is potentially the case that he described, but one of the things is you don't hear anybody else talk about it. There we go. Let's be quiet. You don't think that others of a higher income level, you might say, aren't thinking about this. Well, how exactly, what would be going on? Well, then you have things like the Svalbard Seed Bank. Now, examine who were the movers and shakers behind that process. And it might make you wonder why. But bigger than that is another underreported story. And that's about all the money 
that's missing from government accounts. Catherine Austin Fitz at, at Solari.com has been all over this for a while, actually. Um, she and Dr. Mark Skidmore have come up with a figure of about $21 trillion unaccounted for, missing. Nobody knows where it is. Uh, interestingly, Donald Rumsfeld talked about some trillions of missing money from Pentagon coffers uh, pretty much the day before 9-11 or so. Hmm. Didn't hear about it again, did we? But just to put some context on the $21 trillion, let's stack up $1 bills, and we'll stack them up all the way to the moon. $21 trillion represents six stacks of $1 bills all the way to the moon. Just to give you some context on it, it's not a small amount of money. Where in the heck did this <laughs> did this money go? Well, let's let's start out again. We'll have a little bit of um, a shorter audio actuality of Dr. Skidmore and, and uh, Catherine Austin Fitz about a three minute overview about this whole thing. As you mentioned, I um, hold a chair in state and local government finance and policy, and, and what that means is that I have a little extra funds to do research and outreach-oriented kinds of activities. So I actually work, or, or in the past, um, until my role changed a little bit here at the university, um, worked a lot with people who are connected to Michigan State University in providing, say, training to new county commissioners on how to read a budget. Um, what are the primary functions of government? Um, what's your role as a, as a county commissioner? And here are some resources. So it's very practical kinds of, mm -hmm. I think, helpful things for, if you're a newly elected county commissioner, for example, you might be interested in one particular aspect of county government, but now you have to know, well, where do the revenues come from? And what are my, all the full scope of my responsibilities, which are pretty extensive. So basically, um, these are adjustments that are made to the budget when an auditor doesn't really know what a transaction is. If I can think back, you know, to something a little simpler like a local government budget, there might be some adjustments, but they're very small and they're never larger than the entire budget of a city or a school, um, a school right. district. They're, you know, they're just minor adjustments typically because there was a missing receipt or um, a transaction that, you know, it wasn't clear what that was used for. And that stuff happens all the time. But in the case of um, the, <laughs> the 2016 report for the Army that you had referred to um, in an interview, and this is what got me interested in this whole issue, is um, you, you said in this interview that the Army had unsupported journal voucher adjustments of $6.5 trillion. Now, the entire DOD budget is just five to $600 billion. So, Right. So it's 10 times. We're 10 times, yeah. And I right. just thought, that does not sound right. I, I actually thought you were wrong, Catherine. I thought, she <laughs> must be making a mistake. And so I, I looked at it myself, and... Um, and sure enough, it was there. And I, I thought, how can, how can this be? And my, my thinking on it is if, if enough of us say, you know, these don't pass the smell test and we really need to look underneath the hood here and find out what is the nature of these transactions over the past 20 years. Right. Um, and then, and then we can say, well, okay, what can we do about this? You know, it, it, it really falls on us. Okay, Mark Skidmore and Catherine Austin Fitz. Just a little bit of a, just a snippet of an overview. Now, you would think the missing monies of this unstaggering, this actually staggering number would be picked up by your 
mainstream media. They'd be all over this, you would think, right? Well, wrong. This is something they don't talk about. And it makes you wonder, why not? Over the last 20 years, money has been flowing away into unknown places, and nobody seems to raise a question about it. 20 years. Well, there are beliefs, certain people. Certain people have beliefs that, number one, maybe some of this money is going into the creation of underground facilities. And I think we talked about one where DARPA was actually soliciting input for thoughts on these sorts of things, which other people say has been going on for a long time. I I know of underground facilities that exist in different places, so they do exist. What's the purpose of them? Well, there are different reasons, but could some of this missing money be going into the black budgets in order to fund these programs? Another group of people think there might be a, a secret space program in effect. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, certainly anything's possible. But there are other possibilities as well. One of them I've been looking at recently is kind of a draft type of analysis. Here's some of the high points from stock market. Here's the increase timeline vis-a-vis missing money. Just looking at all possibilities. In the last 10 years, the Dow Jones Index has gone up about 197%. From uh, February 29, 2008, 12,266 to February 9, 2018, 24,190. So it's effectively doubled in the last 10 years. And, you know, people say, well, you know, so what? That's, it's been going up, blah, blah, blah. Historically, though, since January 1915, the Dow Jones has increased 1,234%. However, the majority of this change has occurred since August 1947. And some of you will know why 1947 is a curious date. Since 1947, the Dow Jones has gone up 1,960%. So when you break that down, the 32 years from 1915 to 1947... The Dow Jones only went up 142%. But from 1947 to 1979, it went up 215%. And again, 32 years from 79 to 2011, it went up 426%. So from August 1911, six and a half years to now, it's gone from 12,600 to 24,000. Rounded off, 189% increase, which is more than the entire gain between 1915 and 1947. So, without going digging into this too deeply, I'm going to, I'm going to link, put a link to this draft examination if anybody wants to look at, and maybe contribute to if they like. Where exactly has all this come from? I mean, there are graphs in here that are incredible as far as increases and. I mean, all this value is represented by stock purchases, right? That's what drives the value of stock up. Where is all this money coming from that has been dumped into the stock market? This is an approach that hasn't seemed to have been taken by anyone I can find. It's, where's Waldo? (laughs) Where's Waldo? How is this this happening? So I'm not going to belabor that anymore. Let you look at it yourself. But clearly, there's money being moved around. I'd be real interested to to hear Clint Richardson's spin on this and and with respect to Kaffirs and things like that. Is is there a story here that's not being developed? It makes me wonder about all this. Anyway, that's we'll, we'll add that in as we go along. What else we got? Is there anything left? And Zero Hedge, article that Tyler Durden put up, 17th of October of last year, How the Elite Dominate the World. And it talks about how 99.9% of the world live in a country with a central bank. Now, as odd as that may sound, the ability to create unlimited amounts of currency without any restriction certainly 
aids in the rapid increase of technology or infrastructure of everything and certainly the rapid acquisition of real assets from people through loans and foreclosures and all this. So there's an article we'll just throw in just as, uh, I guess, an illumination about a potential grander plan that's been going on for a long time. I think many people here think that anyway. But this all might make some sense of it. I guess the real questions are, if everything, according to the predictions and the earth changes and all the sorts of things, if all that's going on, why in the world would it be important to collectivize everything, to control thought, these are all the questions I think that need to be examined. Why is that so important? Why is the control paradigm such an important thing at this point? And what's to be gained by controlling all the assets of everything? Is um, If the whole house of cards is knocked down, what, so what's the importance of all that? Something to consider. So anyway, that brings us to the 8 o'clock. Gigi's Boo, you got anything else you'd like to add to all no, this? No, I just... I think we ought to do a show on something real fun for long, so I'm going to leave I'm a hint right here. Okay. What we might do a show on pretty soon. Uh-oh. That we both liked. I really thought this was funny because look at his, part of his, what he left with his legacy popcorn set, and he oh, left yeah. a little message, and I thought it was really good. If you'll go to that page. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll put that... Uh, we might do that pretty soon. Okay, well, that's it for us tonight. Say your famous parting words, Gigi's boo. Okay. Remember to take the road less traveled. And even though I've been quiet tonight, I love y'all big to my heart. Yeah, thanks for listening. Sorry if this was eye-crossing, but I think there's there's a lot of meat here. It needs to be sorted out. Could use some help. Appreciate it if you could offer some. Anyway, take care, and we'll see you next week on the road less traveled. Bye-bye.